This is part one of theory of how a radio works. In this case, we're going to be working with a schematic of an All American 5 radio. It's pretty easy and simple to look at and to follow what's going on. I'm going to start with what is known as the front end of the radio. This is where you'll find your mixer tube here, or sometimes they're called converters and sometimes you'll find them named uh, first detector. I like calling it mixer because that's basically what it's really doing or its primary purpose. In this case this radio will will find out that it's doing a few other things as well. Now your signal will come into your antenna here that's what's represented by this wire and you will tune it with your tuning condenser by turning the knob now I want to touch on this a little bit, this circuit right here. This is a tank circuit, uh, which means it's a, a coil in parallel with a condenser. This produces a filter, a bandpass style filter, that allows you to filter out other frequencies except for the one that you tuned in. Now, in this radio, it's new enough, meaning that it's well was built after World War II. In fact, it's built in uh, probably sometime in the 50s, early 50s. That this coil, which is also known as the antenna coil, is a coil wire that a lot of people refer to as the antenna. It was on the back of the radio. Now some of them were mounted on a board that was mounted inside the radio. This one looks like this series of coils. Now it's referred to as the antenna but in all technicality it's the antenna coil. In order for the filter to work we need both this and our tuning condenser hooked up to make it work. Now some older radios, especially pre-war and there were a few after the war that had they didn't have this coil like this. They didn't have an antenna like this, as it's referred to. They actually had just either some screws, or if you go back far enough, they had spring clips that you hooked an aerial to, which is the proper term, which uh, basically was a piece of wire. And they'd have a ground that you'd hook, uh, if you'd done it right, done it the way the manufacturer said, would hook to a ground rod outside your home stuck in the ground but underneath the radio they still had this underneath the radio what what it looked like was this here this is an antenna coil that's all it is and here's the actual coil right here and, and this one actually has other taps on it and the primary purpose of those taps was the fact it was also for a uh, different other frequencies but n nonetheless it's an antenna coil and that radio actually had just some screws on the back to hook an aerial to if you try operating one of these radios without this what you'll get is distortion um, you'll get pick up a, a strong station very weakly and it'll be very hard to understand uh, mainly because you've disturbed your input filter. Only half your input filter is there. So you absolutely need this hooked up. And by the way, it has to be the one for the radio. This is tuned, in other words, it's wound and figured for this tuning condenser for its size. Now that signal will come in to pin 7 here, which is the grid of this mixer tube. This little cap here is your antenna trimmer. And in your uh, alignment instructions they'll probably talk about antenna trimmer or trimming the antenna as part of your alignment procedure Well, you'll be adjusting this one. Now another part of the input circuit being this is radio is what is known as a super heterodyne radio. You have to have a local oscillator and that circuitry is down here 
Now there's a bunch of circuits here, but we'll break it down. The primary oscillator is just that right there. That's it. That's all there is. This coil and this capacitor. And it actually resembles this in a way. And also this in a way. Except this is an oscillator and not a filter. But it still has a capacitor connected to a coil in parallel. And these are known as tank circuits. And the way this works is it gets shot a voltage. A DC voltage is, is applied to it and once it's applied to it it charges up the capacitor. Now at that point I can't keep the DC on there because all I'm going to end up doing is just keeping the capacitor charged. Nothing else is going to happen. So I got to take it away so it gets taken away. When that happens we have a current flow that goes through the coil. We start discharging the capacitor and we in actuality charge the coil. You can charge coils. Well how you do that is anytime electricity flows through a coil or a wire even it builds a magnetic field. When you coil that wire you get a much stronger magnetic field. As the capacitor discharges, that magnetic field will increase in size, expanding out. When the cap, cap or the capacitor gets fully discharged, no more current flows. At that point, the magnetic field actually starts collapsing. And when it does, it starts cutting back across these wires in the coil. Now, if you take a wire and move it through a magnetic field, then what happens, you induce a voltage. In this case, the wire is not moving, but the magnetic field is. So it, as it collapses, it produces a current. But in this time, in the opposite direction of what it started out with. And it charges the capacitor back up. Once this magnetic field is completely collapsed, the capacitor is fully charged, back up, and then the cycle starts again. But this time, it will go the opposite direction. Now, in a perfect world, all I would have to do is get one little shot of voltage it would run forever, but due to the fact that we have resistances in here and stuff, this thing will die off and by because of heat. It's kind of like um, a swing. You have a child in a swing, you get them going swinging. If they don't keep swing, doing anything to keep themselves swinging, they will eventually slow and come to a stop due to friction and gravity. So I've got to keep this going. The way I keep it going is this coil here. And this particular oscillator is known as a tickler oscillator. Because of this coil, this is known as a tickler coil. See, one end is not connected to anything, the other end connects up to the grid. This is just very few wires on there. It don't have to be much because all you got to do is just give it just a little bit of jolt. It's like with your child in the swing pushing him. Once you get them going, there's going to be a point that you'll stop pushing. You don't want to go any higher. But in order to keep him swinging, every once in a while you have to give him a push. A little bit of a tickle, if you will. A little bit of jolt. And that's what this coil does. Now here is a oscillator coil out of a radio. That right there is the tickler coil. These are the oscillator coils, but there's the tickler coil right there. Just very few windings. It don't need to be much to uh, keep this oscillator going. His other coil is to pull off some signal from that. I mean, my oscillator is no good unless I can make use of the frequency that's coming off of it. So i got to take off or load off of it, and I do that with this coil. This makes this a... Uh, a transformer. It's what is known as a loosely coupled because there's no, it's air coil core, there's nothing in here and that keeps it from loading this too much. If you load an oscillator too much it stops oscillating. So anyway, I pull off from here with this coil and take it back up here, back to the tube. Now the way the tube works is my frequency from the oscillator is going to come in on the cathode. The frequency from here, from my tuning of the radio, comes into this grid. As this comes out, it'll intermingle with this. 
Now what keeps this coming out, this right here, if you take everything away, is nothing but a simple triode tube. It's the triode oscillator. This little grid here is hooked to positive voltage, B+. Plus. It gives this negative coming off the cathode, which is electrons, it gives them a reason to go up the tube. Now, since this is a grid and not a plate like this, it's not a flat piece of steel. This is just nothing but just some very fine wire that's inside the tube, and it's actually fairly far spaced. So it's actually just making a positive charge there, acting as what is known as an anode to give it a reason to move and get past this grid here and so that the two can intermingle. Now, due to various reasons, and when I get into doing something on tubes, I'll talk about those further, what comes out of this tube will be four different frequencies. One frequency will be just the radio frequency that you tuned in. The other one will be just the oscillator. The other one will be these two added together. And the last one will be the two, the difference of the two of them subtracted. This here is IF. It is tuned to a certain frequency. In this case, All American 5 AM radio 455 kilohertz. The difference between these two will always be 455 kilohertz. It will block out everything else but the difference between these two. That's all it gets through it. Now, this dotted line shows your tuning condenser. There's two sections. The dotted line means that they're on the same shaft. The reason for that is, as you tune the frequency here, or turn this condenser, you have to track this. This has to follow. So the frequency of this has to change exactly the same as this one does in order to keep at least a difference of 455 that can get in through and go past the IF transformer. Now, real quickly, one other thing is this is one style of oscillator. Another style of oscillator that is commonly used is called a Hartley. It does not have a tickler. Instead, it has a tap that comes off the main coil here. It may have another tap for here, or it may have a trans transformer winding as far as pulling off of it. But this tap will be actually at one end of the coil, so it's just a few windings that's tapped out. It kind of works the same way, except it's using the same coils as opposed to a separate coil. But otherwise, it does the same thing. It acts the same way, but it's called a Hartley, and this is called a Tickler. One last little thing is in some radios, they'll have a separate oscillator. It'd be just a triode tube, like a 6J5 or something that is acting as an oscillator, and they may also have another tube here that's an RF amp. It's actually a tuned RF amp, and meaning that it actually has its own tuning circuit as well, and there'll be a third gang on your gang tuning condenser instead of being two like this one, I have three. And the idea of the RF amp is primarily for more weak signals than strong signals, but to give more sensitivity to the radio, make it so it can pick up weaker stations, so it amplifies lightly, but it amplifies the signal coming into the mixer tube. And the separate oscillator is not really that big of a deal, but some, some engineers claim that it was a better deal than letting one tube work. And of course, early days, they didn't even have this type of tube, so they had to have a separate oscillator. But naturally, if you have those two extra tubes in the radio, and it may only just be one or the other, but if you have them, the radio is a higher end, it costs more, because it costs more for the tubes and the parts. So you may see something like that. Now on the next one, um, we'll work with the IF section and discuss it a little bit. And if there's a bunch of questions on that, I might come back to this and do some more on this just to answer those questions. So there could be a second part, depending on if there's a lot of questions about how this front end is actually operating. So be looking forward to part two.